I think we'll move on to the next talk, uh, Dr. Tanmay Das. Keeping Dr. Tanmay Das in mind, uh, the protein leverage hypothesis, I don't know what you're going to speak, but we made sure in the diet we included fruits and protein uh, this time, sir. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Bala. And uh, yes, for the last two days, people have been asking me what this talk is about. Well, this is not about high protein diet, as you said. but. Having said that, uh, this protein leverage hypothesis is something so important that I thought I should share it with you and everyone should understand how important the role it plays in our lives. Uh, protein happens to be the most important macronutrient that we eat. The fact is, if you do not get enough protein in your diet, then it is possible that you might be driven to overeat an excess amount of carbs and fats. In the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you why. So uh, the food which we, which we eat can be divided into uh, three macronutrients. I'm going to talk of macronutrients today because I believe that if you do your macros well, the micronutrients will take care of themselves. So your carbohydrates and fat and protein, these are the three macronutrients. And out of that, Proteins are the building blocks of your body. The other two are used as fuels. And what does that mean? It means that proteins are needed not only to build our muscles, but all the cells in the body need proteins for its structure and function. All the enzymes and hormones are made of proteins. But unlike the other two, proteins in the body cannot be stored. And it has to be replenished all the time. Nature and evolution have understood this crucial role of protein in our body and have taken measures to make sure that we get adequate amounts of protein that our body needs. How? This is the interesting thing. And this is the leverage which I'm going to talk about. Research has shown, this has been a, a nearly three decades of research, which has shown that all living beings, whether it is an insect, an animal, or human, all of us have a specific craving for protein, which is universal and which helps animal to reach their protein target. In other words, every living being will keep on eating until their protein needs are met. So small changes in this protein availability can trigger larger changes in animal behavior. If for some reason your protein in the diet is less, then it might, you might be uh, driven to eat more of the carbs and the fat and get in excess calories. This is an evolutionarily built-in response that we have. As I always say, nothing in biology makes sense unless seen in the light of evolution. So we look to evolution for an answer. So this dilution of dietary proteins results in an increased intake of those dietary components relative to which the protein has got dilated, uh, diluted. Sorry. So this is the hypothesis, that there is inadequate dietary protein, which leads, leads to a craving for the protein, and there is a tendency to consume other foods, which are known as non-protein energy, till the protein needs are satisfied. And this could lead to overeating, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and other, and the diseases which are associated with that. So if you look at the figure on the right, it kind of, uh, you can see it's kind of a liver, and this liver, if protein is low, the carbohydrates and the fat tends to go up, and if protein is high, the carbohydrates and the fat tends to come down. So this uh, particular hypothesis was given by David Rubenheimer and Stephen Simpson, who are Australian scientists, and they have done uh, many research, and I will tell you the source a little later. So why did this protein get diluted? Once again, we must look to evolution for an answer. In, uh, when we were hunter-gatherers, all of all the, our entire species were once upon a time hunter-gatherers. And in the pre-agricultural area, we used to eat a diet which was very high in protein and fiber. This protein was as much as 30 to 35% of the calories were supplied by protein then, or 35% of the diet was protein. 35 to 50. With the advent of the agricultural revolution, what happened was the protein got diluted. This is the protein and 
this is the total amount of energy or calories uh, which you can call and the protein has got diluted and moved towards this part of the curve and so what has happened is um, more amount of this rice and uh, wheat was discovered first and then rice had to be taken in to get the same amount of protein. And fast forward to the industrial revolution, what has happened is it has got even more diluted and the body has to, tries to consume more of these sugar grains and cereals and the ultra processed food and, and that is why it, has, it takes in extra extra amount of this food and uh, this is the new body shape which is slowly becoming normal and even the obesity societies are giving guidelines as to new uh, BMI area for obesity. So what basically happens is obesity is simultaneously pushed forward by the dilution of proteins and minerals and pulled forward by the frequent co-ingestion of carbohydrates and fats. So this is what is happening. Now, this does not mean that more protein is better. The hypothesis does not advocate that. Protein is the most satiating of all the three macronutrients which I told you, and there is an inbuilt mechanism to take in the, just the required amount of protein. You cannot overeat it. And once the protein needs are satisfied, the appetite disappears. So once again, the protein leverage hypothesis does not advocate any particular type of diet. It only attempts to throw light on the root cause of obesity and also throws light on the other metabolic diseases. Now, how is this relevant to all of us today? I showed you this diagram last year also, or this picture last year. This is the typical Indian thali that mo most of us eat. And this has been shown to be high in carbohydrates, high in cereals, and pretty low in protein. Well, this is not my estimate, but this has been studied by uh, the International Food Policy Research Institute in Delhi and published in the BMC Health. They compared the Indian diet with the Eat Lancet reference diet. The Eat Lancet reference diet is an international standard which lays down the minimum amount of protein to be taken in by an uh, individual in the next, uh, 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 to meet the food requirement in the next 30 years. So Eat Lancet diet uh, standards are 0.8 grams per kg of body weight of protein. Uh, that is the, what the recommendation is. But it has been found that the average Indian takes even less than half of their, that less than 0.4 or 0.3. And they have uh, um, declared or rather uh, found out that the Indian diets across all states and across all income groups are unhealthy. So Indians also consume excess amount of cereals and not enough protein, fruits and vegetables. And they have addressed this to the Indian policy makers. Another study which is known as the Prodigy study. The Prodigy survey is, is the protein survey in the diet of adults Indian. They found out that a whopping 80% of Indians suffer from protein deficiency. So basically we are a protein, not only a protein deficient nation, we are a protein unaware nation because the statistics reveal that 93% of the Indian population are unaware of the ideal protein requirement per day. And pregnant ladies and, uh, are on the top, following, followed by lactating mothers and adolescents. Now this is very alarming. So we have a protein deficiency not only in the vegetarians but also in the non-vegetarians. Uh, and nearly 80% of the entire population is protein deficient. And this is the current uh, scenario. If there are some data city-wise, not you can read them. But the alarming thing is that it is so very prevalent. And if you compare the protein consumption of India with the rest of the world, we, to, we stand at the lowest. So that was problem number one, protein deficiency. The problem number two, in India uh, today is a huge public health problem which is obesity and Indians are getting fatter by the day. You can just look around in any shopping mall, any airport you will have, you can make out. And this survey revealed that uh, nearly 23% of the men and 24% of the women were found to have a BMI of 25 or more. And, and these are the data once again plotted against a graph. And the alarming and the most uh, sad thing I would say is that the children are getting 
very, very obese, and they have a, a compromised health, and especially the pandemic has contributed in a big way to that. Uh, so data from the uh, Center of Science and Environment India has shown that obesity is India, in India is already an epidemic, and the cost is huge. Not only it costs the state, it is a, a big setback for the individual itself. They cannot participate in <clears throat> activities, and they are much more prone to metabolic illnesses. And uh, as you know today, the non-communicable diseases related to obesity and diabetes are the number one killers today. But uh, the story doesn't end here. Something is much more uh, alarming. That is the overfat pandemic. Now, what is overfat? Overfat means the presence of excessive harmful fat in the body. And this may not be easily visible. In our country, we have some uh, person like, m a very common sight is this. These are known as people who have a thin outside, but a fat inside. They just have a Pot, a small pot belly. So this known as toffee, thin outside and fat inside. How can it be measured? It can be measured by the waist height ratio. You can do it yourself anytime. If you measure your waist in inches and your height in inches and divide it, you should be less than 0.5. If it is more than 0.5, you, you have belly fat. I've given an example. Uh, if that is me, that my example, 32 inches waist and 66 inches height, uh, my ratio comes to 0.48. This is a very sensitive ratio and also, also known as a poor man's DEXA scan. This indicates if it is more than 0.5 that you have belly fat and you have fatty liver and you have visceral fat, which is even more dangerous than the visible fat uh, um, which are invisibly obese people. And now th this has been shown that waist to height ratio is more predictive of years of life loss than even the BMI. The BMI is not a very accurate indicator of obesity. So contributing to the obesity, as I have already told you, is our over dependency on rice and wheat and grains and not um, the, uh, the people in our country, both vegetarians and non-vegetarians, they do not e eat enough vegetables. They eat only cereals and grains, and 70% of the population rely on ready-to-eat and ready-to-cook foods. So basically today we have two major health issues. There are many more, but these are the two major which contribute to the other ones as far as NCDs are concerned. Number one is protein deficiency. Number two is obesity and overfat. So the question I want to ask today is that are they linked? And could the protein deficiency be driving the obesity epidemic? Uh, this talk today asks more questions than it is answered. It is meant to provoke you to think and look around you and see that what is going on. Protein deficiency is leading to the obesity epidemic. And can we use the protein leverage hypothesis to dial down the excess energy consumption? The sad thing is, our evolutionary ancestors once possessed the ability to know by intuition what food to eat and in what proportion and ate the right things in proper amounts. And they had perfect nutritional harmony. And the research which I have told you about showed that all living creatures can balance their diet, except for the human beings. Why and how have we lost this ability is the question I am asking. If you want answers you can so uh, you can perhaps keep this in mind this leverage if you can just keep this in mind when you are eating you can dial down your carbohydrates and fats and then your protein percentage will automatically go up so if you are kind of eating look at the left side of the curve this is unbalanced diet a low protein to carbs and then maybe you go up till here and then go up then you can dial it back to your ideal intake target. Yes, <clears throat> there are, um, it's prolifically published right from 2005 onwards. You can just Google this, obesity, the protein leverage hypothesis. And even 2019, they have given an update, which is very, very informative. So uh, and if you don't want to read those papers, you can read their book. I have no conflict of interest with them. But Eat Like the Animals is a wonderful read for anyone. You can take a screenshot 
and the authors David Robinheimer and Stephen Simpson reveal the answers to these questions which I have asked you today in a gripping tale of evolutionary biology. And uh, it is a must read for everybody. And even if this is not enough, you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel in which I talk about all health matters, metabolic issues, and um, uh, I'm always uh, updated. So you can scan this or just note this down. Thank you very much, Bala, for this opportunity. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tanmay. I was a bit worried, uh, five minutes late, I mean, uh, 30 minutes we had given breakfast and it's only 25 minutes. Then after seeing this, then I was very happy. <laughs> thank you, sir, for your uh, excellent and informative talk. Actually, it's very much important uh, nowadays, uh, most of the percentage of population who is uh, more health conscious nowadays, it's uh, much, uh, you have thrown some light on this. I, I think I would uh, uh, thank Dr. Bala sir for including this uh, topic in our perioperative physician forum. I think maybe every forum should have this talk, like this type of talk nowadays. Yeah. Actually, we changed the diet also based on uh, Dr. Tanmaydas' <laughs> advice last time. That is why you went outside in between, right? No, no, no. I can't change it now. <laughs> I just told Tarlika that a lot of rice will go waste today. <laughs> No, no, actually, Dr. Dr. Tanmay Das also said, all this you should start from Monday. <laughs>